I had some level of expectations of heading into Clash of Champions Sunday night. There were a few matches that I was interested in. And obviously, you had family business that you knew was going to be in the main event. So at least, if nothing else, you had to get through a couple hours of show to get to the stuff that really, truly mattered the most. And by and large, the show lived up to my expectations. It's like a, a bookmark show. Like the very beginning, outstanding. Middle, eh, could largely have done without. The ending, mwah. To all them Roman Reigns haters, I say, where they at, those? Ain't got nothing, nothing. Let the tribal chief do his business. All right, anyways, let's talk about Clash of Champions. And you started off with what ended up being a stupendous ladder match. Brutal, intense. You could feel it. You could believe it. Like, this thing really had me hooked. It's AJ Styles, the pretender champ, Jeff Hardy, and the real undisputed reigning and defending intercontinental champion, Sami Zayn, in a match slanted against him. Like, it's an anti-Canadian, anti-Canucker conspiracy here. He has to defend against both of these guys? In a ladder match for an IC title, they try to say he doesn't have, but he still has, and he never lost it. Like, just fantastic. When you think about extreme match stipulations in wrestling, the ladder match traditionally has been one of my favorite ones. Because it is really, really hard to have a crappy ladder match. Really hard. Much easier to have a crappy steel cage match. Much easier to have a crappy Hell in a Cell match to me than it is the ladder match. Like the ladder match just begs for something good happening. Doesn't mean it always happens. But here you have the right types of participants. You had three, you know, real realistically at this stage, mid-card guys battling over something that mattered. The stipulation made sense because there was story behind it. You had performers that really bode well in this type of format, in this type of setting. Like, even down to the point of Sami Zayn handcuffing Jeff Hardy's ear. Like, just so much about this was fantastic. And Sami Zayn won! Like, if you're looking for real complaints for me with this show, it ain't coming from this match, I promise you. Thank you, Sami. SmackDown's numero dos, babyface. Number two. Well, you can't be number one because there's only one tribal chief. But number two babyface on SmackDown, that he absolutely is. And now, he is the unquestioned, reigning, defending, undisputed Intercontinental Champion of Friday Night SmackDown. That's right. This is big stuff. Celebrate, Sammy. You deserve it. Once we got past the opener, though, like, I, once they made the announcement that a couple of the matches that were scheduled for tonight were going to happen, I'm wondering, like, are these matches all going to go really long? Now, are we going to throw in other crap to kill the time? Are we going to potentially wrap this up a little early? It would be kind of nice. Uh, kind of got a mix in the middle. Like, you have the stuff with the 24-7 title and R-Truth and Drew Gulak. Okay, whatever. It's fine. Uh, but the Raw Women's Championships, Alina Vega and Asuka got moved to the main card. So a lot of you that were pining for this one to be on the main card, you got what you asked for. Um... Like, when I watch Selena Vega, I'm just transfixed by her beauty. And from a wrestling standpoint, like, she just comes across really, really tiny. Like, Sasha Banks, you know, type of thing. Like, it's, it's really hard for me to take her truly seriously as a viable in-ring competitor. And I don't know that she's the greatest as an actual in-ring worker, for whatever the hell that means. Um, but I think she's a good performer in general. And Asuka, there's something a little hot and appealing about her just randomly screaming out stuff. Usually not my jam, but I've, I've come on board a little bit. Yeah, I kind of get it. The only thing that's confusing to me about this match is after it's over, and Zelina Vega taps, she's supposed to be the heel. Why is she then attacking Asuka and saying it's not over when, for all intents and purposes, the, the babyface just made the heel tap out? It usually is the type of storytelling I want you to say it's over. Uh, so we'll see what they do to follow up on this. It was okay. It was just okay. Uh, same thing with the United States Championship match. Maybe if you hadn't seen Apollo Crews wrestle 
everybody from the Hurt Business for the past three months. Like, maybe this match would mean more. But this is something like the, the, the in-ring action itself was really good. And it begs itself to say, like, it's a shame to me that the Hurt Business is stuck on Raw because I'm really a fan of that group, but I absolutely, totally do not want to watch three hours of Raw. I'll catch the highlights on YouTube. It's just not worth it. I can't do that to myself. But it's a shame they've been kind of stuck in this place, feuding over a mid-card title with Apollo Crews. My hope is, is that this finally ends. I was really surprised. Like, you have Ricochet come out with Apollo Crews, but there's no real change. There's no real character shift. There's nothing else that really happens. It's just a match. And Apollo Crews comes across okay in that match, but at no point in time did you, I think, really take him seriously as a threat to Bobby Lashley. And it just... When all is said and done, you're like, okay, now what? And that's pretty much what I got out of this. The Raw Tag Team Championship, to me, is a perfect example of, I understand stuff happens. And I certainly appreciate the fact that during the match, these guys were trying to incorporate hot tags. You know, they were actually trying to work a more traditional tag team style match instead of just going out there and bumping all over the damn place. However, however, there were moments where the timing was a little off and more so when he got towards the end. Like, I look, again, I understand totally. You know, Angel Garza sitting there pulling his best Kevin Nash or Vince McMahon potentially with his quad dangling like he's not moving his left leg at all. I get it. Like, it's not the plan. It's not what's designed to happen. But can we figure out a better way to communicate this type of stuff to where it doesn't throw everybody off guard? Because you get to the finish, and the first reaction is before you realize what might have happened with Angel Garza is you're sitting there and you're saying, did they botch another finish and this time on a pay-per-view? How the hell does this happen? Because it was clear that Angelo Dawkins, it was clear that Andrade had no clue what the hell was going on. It was clear the commentators had no clue what the hell was going on because they kept trying to sell the thing of Andrade's shoulder was up early. But the referee apparently is in the loop and just closes it out, one, two, three, and doesn't bother to communicate with anybody. Like, I don't know if that solely, totally rests and relies upon the ref, but you got to be able to get communicate with the guys. you got to be able to tell them, hey, you know, something's up. You know, stall for a moment. Do something. Like, there has to be some type of communication because you can figure out some type of storyline way to make this work. But when you do something like that, it, it just comes across really poorly. And it just feels like we shouldn't have had to do that. Communicate a little better and avoid that type of stuff. That was just really weird. Uh, the SmackDown Women's Championship, obviously, with whatever's going on with Nikki Cross. She wasn't on SmackDown Friday. She wasn't at this show. Like, I would have been okay if they would have just literally done the thing where Bailey came out. You know, Nikki Cross doesn't show up. She forfeits and raises her hand in victory. And you could figure out a story for that later. I'd have been fine with that. I'd have been fine if you totally skipped it. I'd have been fine if you did treat it as an open challenge and somebody like Naomi, for God's sakes, came out or somebody else, anybody else other than Asuka, who is a raw talent that has already wrestled earlier on in the night. Especially when you look at this and you were just going to have it finish in a wishy-washy DQ finish a couple of minutes anyways just to get to the point where you have Sasha Banks come back neck brace and all and try to get a revenge on Bayley. Like, again, I understand, like, stuff happens. You can't control, like... People potentially being infected with COVID or other circumstances, situation, or potential contact. Like, I get that. Like, these are the challenges that are part of the reality right now. But you got to be able to how to figure out how to adjust better to it than this. And as far as Sasha Banks' revenge, like, you know, I understand maybe they felt like they needed to go here. Or maybe this was a plan all along. I don't really know. I just, it didn't work for me. Just not feeling it. I wasn't feeling it here. And maybe that's just me being stubborn and saying, I don't want these two to start doing this stuff now. This feels like something more. They should be building towards a WrestleMania blow-off versus trying to hurry up and rush and blow it off at Hell in a Cell. Clearly, they're probably trying to set it up for Hell in a Cell, and maybe I can't blame them, but it's just more of the preference of me. Like, But even then, like Sasha Banks coming back, and she's trying to act boss and badass, but she's got the neck brace. Like, it just did not work for me, okay? Um, the ambulance match for the WWE Championship. Like, this is an element, in, in an example, I should say, of storytelling and telling a story and being creative with how you tell that story during the match. I can appreciate that, and I like that. I don't know how much that really helps a Drew McIntyre if you're really trying to get him over as a champion 
where he's wrestling a Randy Orton in an ambulance match, but you got to have Big Show, Christian, and HBK respectively come in at different points of time in the match to attack Randy Orton. So it's kind of six in the one hand, half a dozen in the other, maybe. But I thought the ambulance match was very good. I don't know that I ever really had any doubts that Drew McIntyre was going to win. And certainly, could you imagine if Randy Orton would have still won after getting all that help and interference on Drew McIntyre's behalf? I'm just saying. It was good, though. I mean, admittedly, at this point in time of the night, I was just ready for the main event, knowing that this certainly was not the main event because the real main event was coming up. But it was cool. Like, you got the little spot at the end after the match is over. Ric Flair's the one driving the ambulance. It's like, cool stuff. You know, from a story aspect, closing the book on this chapter. Okay, cool. I get it. I'm okay with that. It was a pretty brutal match. Is exactly what you would expect. So I did enjoy it. But again, let's be clear. It was all about the main event on Sunday night. It was all about one match. It's all about the tribal chief handling his family business. Roman Reigns, the Reignsing, defending an undisputed universal champion of WWE, taking on his cuz, fam, Jey Uso. The build up to this has been fantastic. Like, when you get natural storytelling elements such as family, such as blood, like, it's amazing how much better it is when you talk about wrestling storytelling. And it also is amazing in some ways how easy it can be to tell those stories. So I was really hyped coming into this match. And it delivered. Not every match needs to be booked the same. Not every match needs to be wrestled the same. Not every match needs to have the same type of finish. Doesn't always need to have a count out, a DQ, a pin follower, submission via tap out or something like that. Like, I love this. Sure, the move marks and the match marks may not, but I don't care about them. You're trying to create a character. You're trying to create a badass. And that is exactly what you've done. From having Roman finally ditch the vest and coming out shirtless, and guys, a lot of you should be very thankful because if your ladies were watching with you, there's at least a 50% chance if you're not a total idiot in income poop, you were smashing some puss that night, and you could thank your tribal chief for that. Again, yet another reason he is your hero and top babyface in WWE and all of professional wrestling today. He got you laid. And if you didn't get laid, that's your fault. That's your fault. Uh, he was giving you the opportunity to leverage his shirtless frame and his tribal tats into blowing out some backs. You can't do that, Sanya. But the match was brutal. I love the way Roman's providing commentary in real time. You give Jay a little bit of hope and you give him a little bit of a chance to believe, but you never thought watching this match that Roman was ever truly out of control. And that's exactly what the hell the way it should feel like. This is the tribal chief, for God's sakes. And for those of you that are going to sit there and say, well, that's awful villainy and heelish of him to beat his cousin like that to the point where his bro Jay's brother Jimmy has to come out and try to get him to stop. Hey, look. He spent the past few weeks trying to talk some sense into Jay. And Jay ain't trying to hear it. Jay was trying to get froggy. So Roman helped him jump. He tried to tell him, take this payout and take this ass whoop. And he warned him. And you got Charles Robinson sitting there trying to interfere. What the hell are you doing, dude? That's right. Shut up and take your payout. Roman's got family business to conduct. But this match was Awesome. Easily one of my favorite matches of the year. One of my favorite matches probably in the past few years. Because it was brutal. It played off of family. It played off of those bloodlines. It played off the lineage. It played off the history. Potentially setting up for other things. And even with that, I still think it made Jay come out looking like a million bucks. Tori's opening some eyes about, hey, Jay could be a somewhat decent singles guy. In today's WWE, he's got heavyweight size. He's got some personality. And he was able to throw down with a big Samoan badass like the Tribal Chief Roman Reigns. And he didn't even technically give up himself. Like, Jay was refusing to submit. He was refusing to get, give in. He was refusing to refer to Roman Reigns as the Chief. It took Jimmy, his brother, coming out and throwing in the towel on his behalf to get the Savage beating to stop. But Jay didn't stop, and Jay didn't quit himself. 
One of those rare situations where you can book one guy to look really dominant and overpowering, have him benefit, and have the loser benefit as well. And I think you were able to pull that off here. This is magnificent work by WWE. What else would you expect from the top babyface in the world right now in Roman Reigns? Am I right? Am I right? Of course I'm right because hashtag Schlegdaddy was right again. So best way I can sum this up. The matches mostly that I cared about delivered each in their own ways for me. It allows me to overlook some of the other bad stuff, some of the perhaps even garbage on this show. I loved it. I had a lot of fun watching this on Sunday night. And it wasn't just because of the tribal team. Uh, I might not have enjoyed it as much as some of the ladies did watching Shirtless Roman. And some of you guys might sit there and say, you know, that's another reason to hate him because I couldn't possibly look like that. Well, he's just trying to give you life goals. He's trying to give you motivation. It's not his fault as the tribal chief if you don't live up to his standards. But I enjoyed Clash of Champions. So you let me know in the comment section what you thought about this show and how much you enjoyed that ass whooping, that tough love, that family tough love that Roman Reigns had to give Jey Uso. Let me know what you want to see next for our tribal chief. Make sure if you haven't done so before, smash that subscribe button, click the bell, what the hell, so that way you're notified when I do future videos. Want to see your thoughts on this show. And why Roman Reigns is fantastic. Because this is OTRS Central and I'm the Schleg Daddy. As always, this is not the wrestling show you want. Just the wrestling show you need. And to all them haters again, I ask, where they at though?